You may be the only Christian in your family, or you may be the only one who seems to be seeking after Jesus in your circle of friends. You also may believe that you are the only one in your church who seems to care about world events. You're shaking your head at what's going on in the world around us because it has changed so much since the days that you grew up. Hence, you feel displaced, alone, and not valued. I'm guessing that the believers that Peter wrote to felt the exact same way. So Peter wrote two letters, and in the first letter, he talks extensively about a family, their family. He wanted to encourage them, and he also wanted them to know their identity. Peter's letters are full and rich with hope, assurance, and value, not just for the first century believers, but for us today. Follow me as we continue in our study on the life and ministry of Peter. You don't want to miss it. Before we get into the message, I need to briefly address the terrible things going on in the Middle East, namely Israel. Pastors are preaching about it, teachers are teaching about it, and believers are tuned in. Why? Well, first of all, because it's horrible and our hearts are breaking, just breaking. But also because we're all wondering if this is prophecy being fulfilled and what it means for the time in which we're living. I do believe that there's a lot of prophecy that's being fulfilled right now. But I also think that most Christians do not think about what their response should be. How should I respond to all of this? How should I be living in this day that we're seeing all of these things? No doubt we are living in the end of the end days. I think that prophecy and signs all point to that for sure. And Jesus could come back for his bride at any time. It could be tonight. Imagine waking up and being surrounded by people from the four corners of the earth and seeing Jesus. Nothing makes me more excited than that. With that said, there's not a better time than right now to get your life right with Christ. Walk closer. Press in harder and pour over his word more. Be a stronger witness. Love more. Serve more. Pray harder and follow his word on a new level. And when we do this, we will be ready and waiting for when he raptures us from this earth. Now let's jump into our study on Peter. We have been with Peter for a while. We walked with him in those early days when he was with Jesus, and then we followed him into the book of Acts when he became a great leader and a pillar of the church. You may agree with me when I say that I think the lowest point for Peter was the night that he denied Jesus. That surely sent shivers through his body. But also, probably the highest point in his ministry was when he was chosen to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Peter was in ministry approximately 30 years before his execution in Rome. But after his release from prison in Acts 12, and his part that he had in the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, there's nothing else written about him in Acts. Luke is the one that wrote Acts, and he was a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul, so that's why I'm sure that he follows Paul's travels and not Peter's. We do not know if Peter traveled much or if he stayed in Jerusalem to head up the church headquarters, but what we do know is that there was a lot of years between Acts 15 and the end of his life. By the time Peter was in his 60s, the church had changed, culture had shifted, and the government had transitioned. Peter had gone through times of peace and quiet and also periods of persecution. In AD 54, Nero became emperor of Rome. He reigned 14 years until AD 68 when he committed suicide at the age of 30. In AD 64, the great fire of Rome broke out and lasted for six days. Many blamed Nero. So to deflect blame away from him, he devised an evil plot. He blamed the Christians, and persecution broke out against the Christians like never before. Many Christians were killed or slaughtered or tortured, and even some were strung to posts and lit on fire to be torches in the dark of the night. During this time, Christians scattered all over the place, probably leaving behind their homes and their extended family and friends. 
They were scared and they thought that they would be killed. Surely they must have felt like foreigners in a foreign land. Knowing this, Peter writes two letters. Our lesson this week hones in on the first letter where Peter talks about family. In our lesson, we learn some valuable things about our family that we belong to. Family association, great rewards, responsibilities within the family, partnership, and family suffering. I hope that you were encouraged through your lesson. Something tells me that the believers that were scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia were very, very encouraged when Peter's letter arrived. What I want to do today is look closer at two verses from our lesson, 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. Let's read them and then unpack them. But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Obviously, Peter is comparing our membership in the family of God to the nation of Israel because God said these things to the Israelites. So let's unpack them a little. There are four things that we need to know about our membership in God's family from these verses. One, we are a chosen people. God said through Moses to the people of Israel in Deuteronomy 7, 6, for you are a holy people who belong to the Lord your God of all the people on earth the Lord your God has chosen you to be his own special treasure. We also read in Isaiah 43, 21, I have made Israel for myself and they will someday honor me before the whole world. These words surely apply to us because Peter compares the Old Testament words to New Testament believers. But here's the thing. It's really important that we know that we did not choose him but he chose us and we are treasures, treasures to him. Jesus said in John 15, 16, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. These words speak of our value. We may or may not be valued by the world, by our family or friends or community, but we are valued by God. We are an integral part to his redemptive story. Your story is his story. He picked you for his team, for his army, for his people. He selected you from all the people on the face of the earth to be his. James writes in James 1.18, he chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word. And we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. This alone should make us feel so loved and special for sure. Now, returning to John 15.16, we read that Jesus appointed us to go and produce lasting fruit. This is what draws people to Christ, our fruit. In Matthew 7, 16, Jesus said, you can identify them by their fruit. That is by the way they act. Therefore, our actions need to line up with the word of God. We are a messed up, flawed, and broken people, but God chose us as his own. This is a great demonstration of his love, mercy, and grace. And two, we are royal priests. Paul tells us in scripture that he was the apostle to the Gentiles while Peter was an apostle to the Jews. In Galatians 2.8, we read, For the same God who worked through Peter as the apostle to the Jews also worked through me as the apostle to the Gentiles. Because of that, and because Peter uses a lot of Old Testament analogies, we can be pretty sure that the people that Peter was writing to were Jewish believers what we call today Messianic Jews. And since these people were born into this way of life, they understood the Old Testament priesthood very well. I mean, they had understood and known the sacrificial system. It had been a part of their existence for years. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, 5, 
and you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. So what does this mean? It means that as priests of God, we are to offer anything and everything that pleases God. These are called spiritual sacrifices. And the New Testament actually tells us what some of those spiritual sacrifices are. Let's look at them. First, your bodies are spiritual sacrifices. Romans 12, 1 says, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of what he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Since our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, we should be very careful what we put into them and how we treat them what we eat, what we watch, what we listen to. Paul writes in Romans 6, 13, use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. We often don't think of this as worship, but it really is. And two, our praise is a spiritual sacrifice. We read in Hebrews 13, 15, therefore let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God proclaiming our allegiance to his name. Praise is acknowledging God for who he is and what he's done. And this should surely be a focus of ours every single day. And three, our good works and sharing are also spiritual sacrifices. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 13, 16, and don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. You know, we often get so caught up in our own stuff that we overlook the needs of others. So we need to be very careful and take greater notice and help those in need. And fourth, our prayers are spiritual sacrifices. John writes in Revelation 8, 3 through 4, then another angel with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar. And a great amount of incense was given to him to mix with the prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of God's holy people ascended up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. So ponder these verses the next time that you think that your prayers are not making a difference because in reality, they are a sweet aroma that God just loves to breathe in. Here are a couple more spiritual sacrifices that the Bible talks about. People that we have led to the Lord from Romans 15, 15 through 16 and financial and monetary gifts that we give to people from Philippians 4, 18. So in light of all of this, I hope that you have understood your royal priesthood just a little bit better. And then three, we are a holy nation. God told the nation of Israel over and over again in the Old Testament that they were a holy nation set apart from other nations. In Exodus twenty-two thirty-one, 31, you must be my holy people. Deuteronomy 7, 6, you are a holy people who belong to the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 14, 2, you have been set apart as holy to the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 28, 9, if you obey the commands of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, the Lord will establish you as his holy people as he swore he would do. Two things about being a holy nation from these verses jump out at me. One, a holy nation is separate from the world. As God expected the nation of Israel to be separate from other nations, he expects the same for you and I. This isn't like living like the Amish, but it's like looking and acting differently than the world. People should see you different than they see their non-Christian friends and family. Our thoughts, opinions, actions, and lifestyles should line up with the Bible not the world. Second, a holy nation walks in the ways of the Lord and follows his commands. Hence, we need to take the word of God seriously. The Bible should be our very first resource that we go to, the place where we get all of our answers. 
We should use the Bible to answer questions like, how should I respond? What should I do in this situation? How should I act? You know, you get the picture, right? And fourth, we are God's very own possession. You know, when we purchase something, it becomes ours, right? Some of those things are expensive and some of those things are not so expensive. Sometimes we buy things with, a mon with money, with a gift, or with a service. Well, you know, the Bible tells us that God bought us. And Peter gives us a glorious picture of what this is all about in 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. For we know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God's purchase of us sets us free from sin's grip and eternal condemnation. But it also gives us a place to belong. Jesus paid for you with his blood, so he owns you. You're his. I can't think of anyone else I'd rather belong to than Jesus. Can you? This is our identity. What makes me really sad is to see people that I love try to find love and identity in all the wrong places. They somehow believe that their identity is in their job, their family, people, their community, and what they do, and even in their church. If we believe that any of these things can fill us up, then we become disillusioned and hopeless when they fail, and they will. If our identity is in the one who purchased us, then he is the only one that can fill us up. And when we embrace our true identity, that's when he fills us up with all his goodness, love, security, and purpose. Finally, we read in 1 Peter 2.9, As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. As God's chosen people, royal priests, holy nation, and his own possession, we can show others the goodness of God. And isn't that what we want? To show others our good God? Let me ask you a few questions. Are you offering spiritual sacrifices on a daily basis? Are you keeping yourself pure and holy, setting yourself apart from the world? Are you embracing your true identity and, and finding fulfillment there? If you aren't sure, then let me encourage you to bring it before the Lord and ask him to lead you on your quest to know more of who you are in him. Mm -hmm.